your uncle's dad has one of those houses. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> they're, they're pretty cool if you can if you can live in one, but uh, they they don't just hand those off because they're heavily sought after. Lakefront property is expensive to begin with, just the land itself. Okay, well, I'm going to get started. I got 2 o'clock, um, and we got kind of a lot to cover today. So um, I want to welcome you guys back. I know we've been kind of talking for a little bit, but I want to welcome everybody back. Hopefully you guys had a fantastic weekend, and uh, hopefully you guys got outside one of these last couple of days and enjoyed some of the warm weather that we've been having. Um, this week, what's due on Friday? Uh, we have the AP 6.02 assignment, which is your impact of the Supreme Court nominations. Uh, you guys are going to take a look at that and see why it's so important to um, nominate somebody that is fitting for the Supreme Court and you just don't rush into things because uh, they do have an impact and you guys are going to find that out as well. Um, and if you guys haven't started already, you're, you guys are going to realize that we're starting um, the courts this week. So we're talking about the judiciary uh, system. Yeah, what's, what's your question? Um, so two of the questions that we're supposed to answer, I think um, from the directions we're supposed to choose like three of the different court justices and then analyze um, the, like the nomination process um, for... Well, for the one that I chose, I couldn't find really anything on the nomination process for that person. So what are we supposed to do for that? Who did you choose by chance? Um, I think it was the Ruth Bader Ginsburg or whatever. Okay. Um, where, where, can I ask where you looked? Um, I looked on that OED website or whatever, the link that they gave in the lesson for the assignment. Oh, the, the OES? The OES website? Okay. Um, and there, there wasn't anything on there? Not about the process. It, like, told, said about, like, um, her history, like, the college she went to, and then, and, um, it talked about some of the actions she did while in the court, or the, yeah. Um, but otherwise, it just said that um, Bill Clinton nominated her, and she was accepted, and that was it. Okay. Um, in that case, why don't you just go with that? Just talk about the uh, her prior history, the college that she went to, uh, what her impacts were. Um, to the, the court system as a whole. Um, to be honest, a lot of the nominations are just that simple. It's a matter of president nominates them, it goes to the to the Congress to be approved. Once it's approved, then they're uh, an acting judge. And really, that's the process. There's not a lot to the process itself. So just, if you guys do run into that issue, that's a good question. Uh, just talk about her or his um, kind of prior career, why why they would have been a good fit and why they, maybe they were nominated. Kind of go that route instead, okay? I don't, did anyone else run into that issue? Yeah, the pre-nomination process. Okay, any other questions about the 6.02 assignment? Okie dokie, artichokey. All right, moving along, we have the, the Chapter 16 test, or quiz, I should say. Uh, nothing new there. Uh, you, guys will, you guys are probably pretty routine to that by now. Um, and then you do have uh, Issue Project Part 8. That'll be due. 
And then you, I know you guys are probably cringing already, but you do have another practice essay uh, assignment. Okay? So keep that in the back of your mind as well. Practice essay number six, again, will be on your own. Uh, I'm not going to have it in class. I think you guys have gotten it down, um, and we really haven't had any issues with it. So we're going to keep going with that process of uh, you guys just working on it on your own, turning it in by the deadline. Okay? Uh, do make sure that you guys are handwriting it, which I don't think anyone hasn't. So uh, keep it up. You guys are doing well. Okay? Um, any other questions or comments or concerns before we move on to the courts? Okay. So then today we're going to, we might get through actually two parts, but part one is going to be the court system. And we're going to take a look at the structure and organization itself of the courts. So we're, that's what we're going to focus on today. Okay. We might get to part two. Um, just depends on how fast we kind of move through this. Um, and if you, if you have any questions or comments that come up during the lecture. So to begin with the courts, there's two different types of law. There's criminal law, which is the harmful actions that society has made a crime. Um, and then there's also the civil law, which is disputes between individuals. Okay. So we have these two different types of laws. And a lot of people don't realize that there are different types of law. Most people think that when you commit a crime, it's just kind of all thrown in one category. And that's not the case. There is a division. So again, the criminal law is that, that those harmful actions that society has made a crime. Uh, ultimately, the government files the charges. And usually at the end of the trial, if they're found guilty, is there's going to be some form of imprisonment and fines. Okay? So a lot of these criminal cases, you'll see uh, something that will say, like, the state of Wisconsin versus... Um, Joe Schmo. Okay. Or it'll be like the, uh, the United States versus um, John Doe. Okay. Uh, the, the, that's usually the typical filing of these court cases. They're usually brought down from a, a government official. So that's a, a way to classify this. Uh, in civil law itself, you see the disputes between the individuals. And these are individual filings. So uh, this can relate to contracts. This can relate to property, equal treatment, payment, personal injury. This is all classified under civil law. So if you hear somebody saying, I'm going to sue somebody, it's going to fall under civil law. Okay? So this, you would see a court case of like, uh, We'll just say Brandon Doucette versus uh, Chase Bank. That would be a civil suit, okay? Um, that, that's, the, that's the type of filing. So, again, it's all individualized. Yeah, you know, I see that you guys posted in here community service. Yeah, sometimes under community service, um, that falls under the criminal law. Uh, you, sometimes you'll see convicts or whatever on the side of the road cleaning up garbage. That would fall under that uh, category. And law and order, yeah, that's a great example of criminal law because everything in that show is, well, I should say almost everything in that show falls under criminal laws. The thing with law and order, though, is that it's usually special cases. So, um, but it does fall under criminal law. All right, so the structure of the courts themselves. The federal courts uh, make up about 2% of all the cases. Okay, so there's not a lot of cases that are heard at the federal level. The rest of the courts make up 98%, which would make sense because that would make 100%. So obviously the, the, the vast amount of court systems that are in the United States are local courts. 
There's also district courts as well. There's 94 courts. Uh, there's these district courts have original jurisdiction. Most cases originate in these district courts, and they all and the the district courts themselves collect evidence. So again, just to kind of give you a map, and I think I've showed this earlier in the school year, uh, but if not, here, here it is again. Uh, these are the geographic boundaries of the United States Court of Appeals and the United States District Courts. So you can see how everything's broken up. And where the number is, I believe, is actually the location of the court itself. But you, the, the big thing is that you see the, the breakdown of uh, where the courts are. So you can see um, kind of out on the west coast how everything's kind of based off of population um, and region. And as you kind of start to move west, you can see that we're taking up more states uh, and more and more regions. Uh, so, for example, uh, the 8th District Court takes up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven states, whereas the seventh, it's only the three, uh, Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. And again, a lot of this has to do with population and where people are geographically living. Another thing to note as well is take a look at Alaska and Hawaii. They all fall under this West Coast um, ninth, ninth District. So if you live in Hawaii and you have to go to the Federal Court of Appeals, guess what? You've got to go all the way back into California to um, have your case heard. So that would be quite the, the trip. Well, yeah, but I was saying if you're from like Hawaii or Alaska, you're falling under this ninth district of Court of Appeals. So this is the federal court that you would report to. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, if you lived in California and you lived right next to the, the courthouse, yeah, that'd be that'd be nice, but if you live in Hawaii or Alaska, you get a little bit of a trip. All right, anyways, uh, the Court of Appeals, there's 12 regional circuit courts. Uh, the appellate jurisdiction uh, falls into place of the district courts. And ultimately, at the Court of Appeals themselves, there's no new evidence brought into play. Okay, and actually, being that there's no new evidence, there's actually no trial. Now, why do you, what do you think they do in the Court of Appeals? If there's no trial, do they just sit around, drink coffee, and have a debate about politics, or what? <laughs> I'm sure that would be fun, right? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of them would enjoy doing that, but that's not the case. Well, they're not necessarily deciding the, the punishment, because the punishment's already been given out at the district court level. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly it, Chris. So what they're doing in the Court of Appeals is they actually go through the process of the district court's proceedings, and they make sure that everything was fair. So they're checking the, the process, they're checking the protocols, they're checking the transcripts, the inclusion of evidence, the exclusion of evidence, the witnesses, how they were questioned. All of these different factors come into play, and they're deciding whether or not that that trial was fair. So even when you appeal, if you appeal a case, 
you don't even yourself don't even necessarily have to go to the court. Sometimes you can, sometimes you don't have to, but usually it's just the lawyers and the judge that hear these cases. Okay? Sometimes and like I said, sometimes they will have uh, you there, sometimes you won't. It kind of depends on the scenario, but more times than not, usually the, the person that's found guilty doesn't even have to show up for these cases. Which brings me back to my map. So again, Hawaii and Alaska, this is why they fall under this whole um, ninth district court. So the only people that would really have to travel from Hawaii and Alaska majority of the time would be the lawyers. All right, talking about the Supreme Court now, there are nine justices. One is the Chief Justice. Well, I'm sure if they were uh, lawyers, they're probably purchasing this on a company credit card that has frequent file, flyer miles, I'm sure. And I'm sure they're going and taking nice vacations with those flyer miles. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> Uh, the Supreme Court itself, uh, like I said, there's nine justices total. Uh, one is the chief justice, and then there's eight associate justices. Okay, so one one's kind of in charge, and the others are just there to kind of uh, not fill the gap, but uh, to tr try to keep things uh, uneven. Because remember, you don't want to split decision all the time. So it's more, it works kind of like a committee. And ultimately what happens is there's appellate jurisdiction, uh, which means the appeals court in some state cases ultimately go to the Supreme Court. And what they use is something called original jurisdiction in some cases. So there's different types of precedents that needs to be applied to the Supreme Court itself. We'll get into that a little bit later. So original jurisdiction is between states in the United States, between states and citizens of another state, between states and foreign countries. That is the definition of original jurisdiction. The appellate jurisdiction is made up of federal appeals courts and ultimately the state courts as a last resort. So to kind of give you guys a visual of this and how it works, uh, we have the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, and the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court uh, state route, as well as the federal route over here. So obviously we have our federal Supreme Court on top. So it's kind of a trickle up effect. So if we take a look at the original jurisdiction. These are cases involving foreign Diplomat, so cases involving a state. So again, this can be between the United States and a state. This can be between two or more states, between one state and a citizen of another state. Because again, you come into question, if I have a beef with somebody in Michigan, which state should we have the laws apply to? Should it be my state or should it be their state? So sometimes that comes up as well. And then we also have between a state and a foreign country. So there's all these different scenarios that are playing out.
As far as the appellate jurisdiction at the federal route, uh, these are the U.S. Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, and the legislative courts. And as I said before, uh, the state courts as a last result for the state route. So really this is nothing different than the slide that I just showed you. It's just more or less a visual of what I'm talking about and how it trickles up to the Supreme Court itself. Mm, excuse me. Any questions so far? One thing that you guys will find out with, this, with this, uh, the, the court system itself is you guys are going to find out that it's, while it seems complicated, as you start to piece things together, it, it's just going to kind of make sense. Like it, it, a lot of this is when you piece it together, it just starts to become, I don't, I don't know, almost common sense. But I don't want to simplify it too much. But it, it just kind of makes sense. Like you would have your local governor, you'd have your local courts, kind of hearing a lot of the local crimes. It wouldn't make sense to have all of these local crimes go straight to a district court or a federal court, meaning the Supreme Court. It just kind of makes sense. And you'll see that with the organization itself, it's just common ground. Like they didn't try to over, when they, when they set up the structure of the courts, they didn't try to make it confusing for people. Uh, but, uh, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there. Bottom line is that the, the, the court system itself, the structure is really straightforward and there's not a lot of hidden loopholes. All right, so let's take a look at an example from 2006 in the Supreme Court cases. So the types of cases are on the left and the number of cases are on the right. You have original jurisdiction cases, a big old goose egg, okay? Civil actions from the lower federal courts made up the most at 47. Federal criminal and habeas corpus cases made up 17 cases. Civil actions from the state courts made up four. And then finally, state criminal cases made up three. For a grand whopping total of 71 total cases for the year. Now that's the Supreme Court. So what's the moral of this story? I think you guys already can see where this is going. Or hopefully you can. I try to put, or I try to sprinkle in some foreshadowing. Well, yeah, don't be a criminal. Also, don't sue anybody because it seems like that ends up going to the Supreme Court, <laughs> meaning that it, that's the biggest. But really, look at look at the total number of court cases. The answer is in the bottom line right here. 71, 71 court cases. I tell you what, go down to your local uh, court or courthouse. I bet any given day you could probably sit down and you could probably sit in a court case and there would probably be at least three or four court cases each day. The moral of the story is, is that the Supreme Court doesn't hear or handle a lot of cases. They really don't. And whether that's good or bad, that's kind of up to the system, and that's up for debate. Some people feel it's a good thing. Some people think that they should maybe hear a little more to try to clear out some of the, the airwaves. Some people feel that even if they did, the, the, if the Supreme Court did hear some of these cases, that really it's just a waste of time and effort. So if you take a look at the assignment that you guys are doing, talking about the impact of court cases, right? Or Supreme Court justices, I should say. You're taking a look at the Supreme Court nomination process 
and the impact that it has. So when a president nominates a Supreme Court justice, usually it needs to be somebody that is very, 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 very uh, knowledgeable of the law and has a very rich background in uh, understanding different court cases and how the whole Constitution and the criminal justice system works. Because when a, when a Supreme Court rules on a case, ultimately that's the, that's the highest level that is going to be attained. So whatever they said at that point is going to be the law of the land for the future, for better or for worse. Which brings me to kind of a side topic and a side note. Um, I think I've talked about you, with this with you guys as well, is the death of Anthony Scalia, who was a justice on the Supreme Court. He had just recently died a few weeks ago. And now there's a lot of hoopla and debate within politics as to whether President Obama should nominate a new justice this term or if we should wait till the next president. So there's a lot of debate as to whether or not that should happen. Some are saying that it's not proper to nominate a justice during the middle of an election season. Um, and then some are saying that while the president was put into this position, uh, he's our president, it's his duty to nominate somebody, and he should do that. So there's a lot of controversy surrounding that. And, you know, it is something that you need to take a look at and, and, and not take lightly because it does have precedence for the future. And this total court case down here says that. So here's a little diagram of how the, the court cases work. So you have your federal courts and your state courts on the left. So you have cases coming from both of these court levels, okay? probably more from the state level than the federal level, but you do have cases coming through, okay? You then get to this next step in the process, which is request for Supreme Court review, okay? So you have to request the Supreme Court is just going to look at it and review it, okay? They're not going to do anything. They're not going to rule. They just want you to look at it. And this is approximately 8,000 cases per year. Okay, so you're looking at 8,000 cases per year. That's a lot of cases, okay? Remember, we go back to the last slide. How many did, you, did they hear in 2006? 71, right? So you're going to see that we're going to narrow this down from 8,000 to approximately 71. It, it, each year is different. 2006, it was 71. Uh, that number does fluctuate. But, yeah, um, it's not a lot. So after the re uh, request for the Supreme Court reviews, the appeals discuss at a conference whether or not it's worthy of going to the Supreme Court. And in this stage, you see this little box that comes down here. About 99% of these cases are denied. They're going to say, nope, denied. HBO, I don't even want to know what you're going at with that, Chris. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what, what your underlying theme is today. <laughs> but anyways, 99% um, of the, the court cases themselves are denied at this step, which then... If you do get past this conference, you have to obtain four votes in order to get the majority. Okay? Or I shouldn't say majority, but obtain four votes to move on to the next stage. And the next stage is placed on the docket for a hearing with the Supreme Court. And again, this is fewer than 100 cases a year. So like, I, like the previous example I showed before, we had 71 court cases. Um, that number ranges, but usually it's right around 100 or maybe even less. So you could say that a good portion of the time is spent 
here just weeding out some of the garbage claims that get sent to the Supreme Court. I shouldn't say garbage, but uh, a lot of them are thrown away and treated as garbage. Any questions so far? Well, if you robbed the federal treasury and you probably and you got found guilty, is that going to go to the Supreme Court or would that go to the state courts or the federal courts? What do you think? Right, yeah, it's going to go to the federal courts. Because if you rob a federal treasury, that's federal jurisdiction. Which would fall under what category of law? Is that criminal or civil? Criminal. See, this has come full circle now. It's so good that you guys are even providing me examples so that you guys can learn from your own examples. That's true learning right there. So everyone gets a gold star for the day. <laughs> All right. So I think you guys are good to go on the structure portion of it so far. I, I did not. Nice try there, Chris. I was testing you. Let's, let's go with that. I was testing you guys to see if you come up with your own examples. <laughs> but in all honesty, actually, that's the best way to learn is by coming up with an example and, and, and trying to apply it to what you're learning. So, um, no, I think you guys are, are sitting well. <laughs> It's like the, that old Chinese adage of the master and the, and, the, the, and the trainee, and you guys are finally becoming more advanced trainees. <laughs> exactly, wax on, wax off, right? <laughs> okay. Now what we're going to do is we are going to dive into the court system itself. Uh, we're going to take a look at part two, which is the Supreme Court. Um, and we're going to get a little more deeper with the content. Okay, so before we just got a basic understanding of the system, now we're going to take a look at the Supreme Court itself. So again, the, the Supreme Court's role can only decide actual disputes, meaning cases. Okay, they, they, there's no decision on theoretical issues. So there has to be something tangible sitting in front of them for them to actually decide on. Cases involving federal law or constitutional issues are usually the cases that the Supreme Court hears on. So kind of going back to Chris's example about robbing the federal treasury, chances are you're going to hear the first case itself is going to be heard at the federal level. Okay, so you'll go to a federal court, you'll, you'll have your case heard like a normal court case, and from there they'll, they'll give you a ruling. And if you don't like that ruling, you go up to the next step, <coughs> which would be the Supreme Court. And then you go through that process that I showed you guys before, where the, the Supreme Court hears it and decides whether or not it's worthy or not of going to the Supreme Court's docket. Ultimately, what the Supreme Court does is their job is to interpret the Constitution. Okay? So when they are applying a law and they're ruling on a case, what they're doing is they're taking the Constitution itself and applying it to that scenario to try to give a precedence for future laws. So like I said, they decide on how it applies in a particular case, 
and ultimately they could declare laws or executive actions unconstitutional. So if President Obama decided to sit, tell everybody that we can wear or that we have to wear pink on Wednesdays, okay, my mean girl reference every, that I always use, President Obama decides that we're going to use or wear pink on Wednesdays, it's up to the Supreme Court then to decide whether or not that if that law breaks the Constitution or not. And depending on who's sitting on the bench, your decision can change. Because you have different views and interpretations. You have strict interpretation, and then you have a more broad inter interpretation. And a lot of these times, these conflicting views do clash with on the Supreme Court bench. Which is a part of the reason why they do have nine justices serving on the Supreme Court. Because think about it. If you get appointed to life on the Supreme Court, right, that's, that's what happens, would you want one person for the rest of their life deciding the interpretation of the Constitution or multiple people deciding the interpretation of the Constitution? Probably multiple, right? You, you probably don't want one person, whether or not they're, they're con I mean, that one person could have a fair interpretation, so don't get me wrong. You know, they're not saying that they're corrupt. It just could be uh, one person that would be ruling on all these things for quite some time. And then you come down the road, maybe 40 years later, and then you have a new person sitting on the bench, and maybe their viewpoints and their opinion of the Constitution might differ from the past justice. So now you have discrepancies from now to the past. So now you got to go back through all those old court cases rule on those to make them your case or your viewpoint, and plus anything that's coming down the pipeline, right? That's winding. <laughs> and just daunting talking about it. I couldn't imagine actually having to be a justice and working on that. So it's a good thing that they have nine justices in place so that they can kind of debate these things and weigh both sides of it and try to rule one way or another. So there is fairness built into the system. Again, talking about the Supreme Court uh, process, the court itself has original jurisdiction on some cases. Uh, the case is applied to the court itself. Ultimately, they have to be petitioned to hear the case. And it must be a substantial federal question. Okay, So that's what kind of justifies whether or not they can even really go to the Supreme Court itself. So in the case of Chris's bank robbery, do you think that a bank robbery would be a substantial federal question? Probably not. If the guy robbed the place, and it looks like he robbed the place, chances are the Supreme Court doesn't need to hear that because there's overwhelming evidence, and there's really no federal issues in place, right? But, yeah, that, you bring up a good point there, Chris, is the, the FBI versus the Apple Inc. scenario. So if you haven't heard, what's happening is the FBI is asking Apple to open up and create basically a backdoor into all their phones so that the government can get into the San Bernardino uh, shooter's phone and, and decide whether or not their ties and the, the information that was given um, or sent through his phone to decide whether or not how he's related to possibly ISIS and other terrorist groups and so on and so forth. Okay, Apple then kind of shot back and said, no, we're not going to do that because what you're doing is you're asking us to create a program that is not existent and you want us to basically create it out of nowhere so that you can get into any phone in the United States which goes against a, a ton of privacy, and really that's what we're based on as a company, is that we want to give our, uh, our, our users privacy. So there's a lot of debate right now, and, and there's a good chance that this probably, right, and you're right, there is precedence, and, and so on and so forth. There, you know, there is that whole debate, and I talked about this last semester, was freedom versus order. You guys remember me talking about that? And politics ultimately this matters in the fact of where do your values lie, okay? So in this case, where do you value, where does your values lie? Do you 
why with freedom, meaning you have the right to privacy, or do you want the FBI to be able to investigate these phones and potentially curb off terrorist activities? That, that is the great debate for future generations. And I'm not asking you guys to weigh in on it, so you don't have to weigh in on this, uh, but that's really the question that's, that's coming to the forefront. And, you know, this, I, to be honest, not to try to, you know, plug AP government, but this topic with the, with the uh, Apple versus the FBI is very topical for AP government because it's, it really wraps up a lot of the, the main ideas that we're talking about in class kind of into one court case. And to be honest, future AP classes, if this does go to the Supreme Court, will study this case. This is a very big case, so if you do have time, um, you know, just take five, ten minutes and look it up because it's, it's a very precedenting case. Yeah, it, it's going to make history. I, I, just where we're at right now, and from what I understand of it, it's probably going to be history making. Yep. It, it, it's, it's so important. We're kind of at a crossroads in the United States as well with this whole uh, invasion of privacy versus do we want to curb off terrorist activities. So yeah, this will definitely be a precedent. Anyway, anyways, getting back to the, the Supreme Court process itself. The, the four out of the nine justices must agree to reviewing the, or to the reviewing hearing. Okay, so almost the majority have to agree to the reviewing hearing. After it is accepted, there's something called the writ of certitory, which is the formal calling of a case. One thing that you guys will notice with courts is that there's lots of Latin put into uh, the courts. All right, you would think five out of nine would be the majority, but in this case, only four out of the nine have to review the hearing. Which is a little confusing because confusing because you think, wouldn't you want a majority to hear this? But it's just the, the policies and procedures that they have in place that they say four out of nine have to agree to the review hearing. So after the formal calling of the case, you're going to have a petitioner. And this is the party who appealed. Okay? And then you also have the respondent and this is the other party involved. So usually you hear plaintiff and defendant, that's more in a criminal case. Civil cases, you're going to hear the petitioner and the respondent. Which makes sense because if you think of respondent, it's got the subword respond in it. So that's usually if someone asks you something, you respond back to them. That's one way to kind of remember respondent. Yeah, and well, yeah, that's what I was kind of uh, briefing before is that court, you're going to find that a lot of court terms and court definitions have all of their roots in Latin. And a lot of that ties back to the, the methods that they used in Greek and Rome uh, that have just created precedents for future uh, generations. So again, here's that chart that I'm not going to show you again. The briefs themselves are written positions, and these have pre been presented from both sides. So you're going to present a brief, and again, more Latin, amicus cura briefs are, the, are from the other groups interested in the outcome. You're then going to have oral arguments on both sides. So each side presents their main points, their case. The justice is going to can listen, they can ask questions. Ultimately, after the oral arguments, the justices meet and discuss, and this is coordinated by the chief justice. The justices then vote on the decision itself for the ruling. 
So then again, you get to the decision, the court's ruling on the case. Um, you'll have the opinion, which is a legal reasoning behind the decision. You have a majority opinion, the view of the majority of the justices. This is the only one that counts as legal precedent. So when the, when the court hands out their rulings, the majority opinion is what is the final verdict. Okay? But, and this is a big but, you have to understand that the opinion does come out of the court cases. Okay? So it's, the opinion itself is just the legal rationale behind the majority opinion. And the majority opinion is just the view of the majority of the justices. Okay? The concurring opinion agrees with the decision, but in a different or a different in legal reasoning. So they might have the majority opinion, but the reasoning to get to that majority opinion very well could be different than what the majority opinion decided on. So this is where it kind of gets a little tricky. And then finally you have dissenting opinion, and this is the justices who disagree with the decision. So these are the people that are opposed to the majority opinion. Now can you guys think you can keep that straight? Hopefully. Hopefully you can. Silence means I think you guys have it straight. If you guys kind of poke around, I think I've showed you the, the LES website in the past, and I think we've used it a couple times. But if you kind of poke around on that website, they have every single Supreme Court case on there and all of these different decisions. So they have the majority opinion, they have the concurring opinion, and they have the dissenting opinion. So if you want to take a look at some of those court cases that I've had you that have given you guys to study. Take a look at those and go on to this OLES website and take a look at the different opinions. You're going to find that some are very favorable and have a strong majority opinion. And it was kind of common sense and they said, yep, this is what it's going to be. And then there's a lot that are split and there's, there's some people that had a strong dissenting opinion. And it makes sense both ways. They also have announced decision as well. And this is ultimately the tie or the vacancy or a recusal. And this is the lower court, court decision is ultimately upheld. Okay, so they say this is what happened at the lower courts. We went through this. We think everything that they did was fine. We may have found some flaws, but at the same time, what their decision was, was fair and just. And that's the announced decision. All right, last thing I want to talk about for today is stare decisis. And what this is, is the earlier court's decisions are used as a precedent, a precedent in current decisions. And in Latin, what stare decisis means is it means let the decision stand. Okay, so whatever the, the decision was before, let that stand. That, that's what we're going to use. So ultimately, this is creating something called a precedent and really, it creates the precedent on how similar cases were decided in the past. And it's going to influence current analysis and decisions for future cases. Yeah, that's the best way to summarize what I just said, is it's really the legal precedents. Remember, though, the Supreme Court can overrule precedents. So if they decide that it's against the Constitution, and the precedence was this, but, you know, it's, it's unconstitutional what's, what's happening. The Supreme Court can overrule that. So you take a look at this chart. You have the cases on the docket. Again, you have the briefs submitted by both sides. So the amicus curiae briefs are filed. You have the oral arguments, 
You have the conference cases, discuss votes taken, opinion rating assigned. Finally, you have the opinions drafted, and then you circulate it for comment. And then finally, you have the decision that's being announced. Okay. So, yeah. In your case, Chris, what you're talking about is, so every court case that comes out beforehand is ultimately overturned. You're right. And only the Supreme Court has that power and influence to do that. Because remember, whatever the Supreme Court rules, that is final. That's, that's where the buck stops, and that is ultimately the law of the land. Because remember, what is the Supreme Court's job? In the end, what what are they? What are those chief justices trying to do? Well, not only enforce the laws, right? They're interpreting the Constitution. All right, that is their job is to interpret the Constitution. So they're a little bit different than the state judges because guess what? The state judges interpret their state constitution and their state laws. The federal judges do the same thing. They interpret federal laws. The Supreme Court interprets the Constitution to make sure that the Constitution is being upheld by all parties, whether it's uh, politicians, whether it's everyday citizens. So if courts at a lower level, even though there's a precedent for many court cases that this is how they rule, but eventually it goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, you know what? All these rulings in the past were unconstitutional. It's just finally taking its time and its toll to reach the, the Supreme Court to say, you know what? We need to make a ruling on this. So if the Supreme Court rules against a precedent, yes, all those past court cases are now thrown out. They're thrown over the shoulder. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Can you guys think of maybe a time or an era that this might occur in? Think U.S. history. Bingo. Segregation. Segregation. For so long, remember, African Americans were treated as property, right? And the precedent was separate but equal. Separate but equal. Separate but equal. How many court cases do you think there was at the state level relating to separate but equal? Probably quite a few. Many, 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 right? And finally, the Supreme Court struck down and said, you know what, separate but equal it's not equal, okay? And we're going to create the new precedent and up over the shoulder it went, okay? So yes, there are times in history that the Supreme Court has struck down and said, we are going to make a stance, we're going to make a stance on this, and we're going to throw and make a new precedent. So yes, this does happen. Good, 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 good. All right. Um... We're going to stop there for today. Is there any questions that you guys might have for me? Okie dokie. You guys are free to go for the day. Have a fantastic rest of the day, everybody.